My name is Ali. I watch your, I watch and love your videos on YouTube. So huge respect for you. I am a first final year CS student at the University of uh, in UK, and wondering what backend language framework should I really specialize in to become a freelancer. Let me give you some context. I have experience in Python, Java, front end. I'm comfortable with HTML, CSS, JS, and React. I'm currently doing my final year project with React on the front end and Python, Flask, MongoDB, and Redis on the back end. My question is, as I aspire to be a freelance full stack developer, should I pick up Django, Node Express, or Java as my back end language framework to specialize in? I don't want to stay with Flask because I don't think there is much in demand. I definitely plan on staying with React for front end because I love it. But which back end language suits suits is best in my scenario to help me become a freelancer. I was thinking about Django, but the opportunities available seem decent, not amazing. Node opportunities are much more. I'm not too sure about how popular Java is with React, though I love its strong typing nature though. I would agree. The irony is though Java has a lot more um, a lot more things you got to take care of when you're writing Java code relative to something like a Python or a PHP or a a Ruby, but uh, the strongly typed nature of Java makes it very explicit, meaning everything is obvious about what's going on. Whereas with some of the uh, lighter scripting languages like the JavaScripts, etc., some things are implicit. So unless you know the language uh, well, some things kind of be confusing as to why JavaScript behaves in a particular way. Anyway, not just JavaScript, other scripting languages. That's one of the advantages of a strongly typed language. Strongly typed languages are languages where you have to explicitly, deliberately declare the uh, variable types, the data types. At the end of the day, people watch my videos on a regular basis know the key to figuring out which stack, which technology to concentrate on is to figure out where the opportunities lie. As one of my mentors used to say, follow the money, Steph. This, as, is, this applies to business, this applies to getting a job, this applies to freelancing. You got to go where the demand is. People have to want to buy what you are selling. So what you want to do is you want to look at the freelance market and determine what it is people are asking for in terms of when they're hiring freelancers. You may find that the freelance market is very hot for Node in the UK and for employment it may be hot for uh, Java, I don't know. It uh, it's something you have to do and check your local markets. That's the key to it all. Again, people who know my channel know the key to becoming a productive, financially uh, capable developer is to get a good, strong understanding of the fundamentals, and then you just use uh, the market as your guide to determine what technology stack you're going to implement. That's pretty much it. If you do that, uh, you'll be fine. And what you're going to find, though, as you progress, especially as a freelancer, there's going to be a lot more variety. So it actually can be exciting as a freelancer because, you know, in year one, you may do a lot of uh, Node.js, and then year two, you find yourself implementing uh, Django, which interfaces with uh, some TensorFlow uh, library, who knows, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you may find yourself doing different things based on uh, the demand at hand, or you may find yourself in a hyper niche situation. I remember a guy said that he was doing a lot of, uh, of all things, I think it was cold fusion, but he was, he had so much work in cold fusion because there wasn't too many cold fusion developers. And there's still people who have invested a lot of money in their cold fusion based applications. And so they needed developers. Now, you may not want to stick in that too long because ColdFusion is kind of a dead end, although it'll probably be around for many, many years because once a company has invested a bunch of money in an infrastructure that works for them, they don't want to rewrite from scratch because, you know, anybody knows when you rewrite software from scratch, you're going to replace set of bugs A for set of bugs B. Uh, very rarely do you want to rewrite from scratch. For example, I just did that recently with Studio Web. After many years, I decided to do the rewrite, and I pulled the trigger at the right moment because the old code base got to the point where it was just not uh, 
maintainable if I want to expand and add new capabilities. It was at the point where if we want to add a new functionality to the software, it was like I was on pins and needles because you didn't know if you added this, if it would break that. That's just a real messy code base that developed over years and years of not having multiple developers, having uh, on, on, uh, not having a clean understanding or a sure understanding of what the use case was. So it was a bit of a mess. Anyhow, so we did. I pulled the trigger on the rewrite after all those criteria were satisfied. So now we can add new features, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, back to the question at hand. Yeah, let the market guide you. And remember, as a developer, you are not a JavaScript developer. You are not a Node developer. You are not a Java developer. You are a developer when you get to the high level and you happen to use Python for this project or you happen to use Java for that project or you happen to not use Ruby for another project. I want to reach the 10 minute mark. So uh, let me answer another question. Can you explain more about AWS and the cloud services in general and how to get started as a front end dev? Cloud services and front end development are not really too related. Uh, cloud services are about the back end, about hosting of the site. Uh, they're two separate subjects. Um, again, learn your fundamentals and you can start looking at uh, advanced cloud services, uh, serverless, uh, uh, type of deployments. Um, we're seeing different types of models in terms of web application and even um, mobile application development is concerned. And a big part of the change in the models has to do with more sophisticated cloud-based hosting. I've talked about this before. So you have AWS, you have Microsoft Azure, you have, uh, to a lesser extent, DigitalOcean has their thing. We use DigitalOcean, there's other providers. And what it is essentially is that hosting is becoming more and more and more sophisticated. And so you can use third-party hosting solutions that will be able to deliver not just a disk space in, in, uh, on their servers, but all kinds of utilities and capabilities and processes that you can leverage in your apps. What do I mean by processes? Well, instead, it, I'll just use like a simple basic example. Instead of uh, setting, setting up, um, I don't know, a newsletter service, you just hook into a newsletter service provider. You can hook it into your app uh, as an API, or maybe you could use it just to verify, use a, a, a spam, and here's a, a simple one. Instead of trying to filter for spam in your app, if somebody has to you know, enter an uh, email address, maybe you use a third party a tool that you can send the, e the email address entered to like, I don't know, Microsoft may have one of these microservices. And all it does is check to see whether that email is actual, is a real email or not. And then it comes back yes or no, and then you commit to database or not, depending on whether or not uh, you get a positive or negative from the microservice. It goes on and on from there. It gets more and more sophisticated as you go on. Another example I like to give is just database scaling with uh, advanced solutions that you see they all provide AWS, uh, Microsoft, uh, DigitalOcean. You don't have to engineer uh, horizontal scaling or sharding of your database anymore. You just upload your tables and you pay for database computations, if you will. It's really quite sophisticated. And if you need to scale, it will take care of the scaling for you. Um, depending on how much you got to do and depending on the particular platform, there's different levels of sophistication in that regard. But that's just one quick example of how uh, servers are simplifying to a certain extent the, uh, the development process because they are able to provide all these services, these microservices to you and other services, which you used to have to build yourself. So um, do you jump into AWS now? No. First thing you got to do is your foundations. You got to understand basic web app development and so forth. And then you can look at these solutions. Now, AWS, Azure, uh, especially AWS, I think those are for larger projects, larger uh, larger organizations because they require more money and there's, they're more sophisticated, may require more setup. But you have more middle of the road solutions coming out, meaning easier to implement, cheaper to implement, and uh, you may want to look into that as well. Like DigitalOcean, for example, 
If I want to load balance my app, it's pretty simple with DigitalOcean. It's like really simple with DigitalOcean. I've talked about this in the past. Literally, you can set up a load balancing uh, scalable web app, whether you wrote, wrote it originally in PHP or Django, C Sharp, whatever language and stack you happen to use, you can, within minutes, set up load balancing with DigitalOcean without having to rewrite any code whatsoever. It's pretty powerful stuff. So that's just one example. So there you go. Yeah, do you jump into AWS now? No, again, on a need to nerd basis, on a need to nerd basis. That's one of the founding core principles of, of what I teach for years and years and years, and not more than a decade and a half. That's, by the way, my newsletter. It's called Need to Nerd. The Need to Nerd newsletter is coming out very, very soon. So I will have links and videos when it comes out. And so I'm going to invite you to join that. The Need to Nerd po- uh, newsletter, rather, is it's also going to be a podcast. It, it basically is going to be exclusive video content and probably audio content uh, for newsletter subscribers. And again, I'm going to flesh out in the Need to Nerd community the Need to Nerd uh, philosophy. It's a play on Need to Know, right? Need to Know, Need to Nerd. And the idea, which is, I think it's kind of unique out there on the interwebs. People think about, I got to learn this, I got to learn that, I got to learn, oh my God, I got to learn this, before they even get a job. And I say, no, 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 no. You learn what you need to learn on a need to nerd basis. When a project comes up, when you have to implement a certain type of functionality that requires a particular technology, then you learn it. Right? Otherwise, you're going to be caught in tutorial hell. You're always going to be second guessing your own capabilities uh, when you, you shouldn't have to. You know, Need to Nerd teaches you that um, nobody knows everything. It's literally impossible to know everything, not even close to everything. And, uh, and when you get really good and advanced, you're going to start forgetting a lot of stuff you used to know. So today, in all honesty, I literally forget much more than I know today. I, you know, and no, it shifts, right? But that being said, because I did in the past, I can jump back into it and get up to speed within a few days. But again, keep that in mind. Need to nerd philosophy will serve you well in life. Will take care of a lot of anxieties. Will tell you, uh, it will tell you and guide you how to proceed with your career with your business, freelance, get a job, etc. And uh, yeah, it would just take away a lot of anxieties because it's just the truth, you know? It's just the truth. All right, I should let you go. Bye-bye.